Happy Thanksgiving. I hope you got some plans for Thanksgiving. It is one of my favorites. It's definitely my favorite meal of the entire year. I know I've said that before. Um, I think that for believers, it's really important for us to be people of gratitude. You know, uh, in my own life, whenever I feel anxiety, when I feel stress, and yes, I feel plenty of anxiety and stress, um, the scripture verse that comes to me most often is from Philippians, um, and it is basically where we are told, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your heart. And so for me, I feel like when I really pray and when I am grateful to God for all the things that he has done in my life and all the things that he's given me, uh, I mean, he is this fountain of blessing that just pours out good things into our lives. When I get there, there is a deep peace that I think goes beyond whatever anxiety I'm feeling. It is very important that we are people of gratitude. Today, our service is going to be a little bit unusual. We're having a deacon ordination service, but I thought it seems appropriate that we do thank the Lord uh, as we are having a service like this, deacon ordination. And I'd like you just to consider for a minute your 2020. What has 2020 looked like for you? Like right now, you're probably not going, I have so much to be thankful for, right? You're like, there's corona and racial issues and political unrest and all of these different things. We are a split, divided country. Look at all the negative, all the bad. But if the truth be told, there's some really good things happening too. And I think not least among those great things that God has done, that he has given us and blessed us with, is the fact that he is moving and active among this congregation. And the fact that we are having a deacon ordination means God is at work in Jason's life. We're ordaining Jason Overton today. And I think we as a congregation should be grateful that we recognize that calling in his life, that fact that God is at work and in moving and who he is, and that, that we have opportunity to have a service just like this. Not just where, where we would ordain and set aside uh, Jason, but where all of our deacons, we would sort of renew ourselves, yourselves, in terms of ministry. And all of us, we who are believers, would say, Lord, am I that kind of person? that you would call out, that you would set aside for a special purpose? Am I living up to those biblical qualifications that we see in Scripture for a deacon? Because that's the kind of person I believe God would have all of us be if we get really honest with ourselves. So I hope today you don't just sit back and go, Woo, good, this is a sermon for somebody else. That's my favorite kind, you know? But instead you say, huh, I wonder if this applies to me. God, what would you do in my heart? How would you change my life to make me more the person you'd have me be? Today, our passage of Scripture I want to look at is in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. And so if you've got your Bible with you, would you turn to that? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. Um, I am also going to reference a pretty good bit from Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. But 1 Timothy 3, 8 is, I think, sort of primary today. Um, And I feel like really what we need to do is open up with some questions. Just in case, you know, you're brand new, you've never been to church before, you hear this, what is a deacon? You're having deacon ordination? That doesn't make sense to me. Are you even speaking in English? Well, kind of. Okay, so so what's a deacon? Biblically, who are deacons? Where did the term come from? The word deacon is actually a Greek word, and we didn't translate it. We just brought it straight from the Greek over into the English. And so the Greek word is diakonos, and we just said, we like that word, deacon, let's anglicize it. But if we translated it, the word deacon means servant. And that would be somebody who waited tables or washed clothes or cleaned your house or or whatever. It was a lowly person who served others. That's what a deacon is, is a servant. Um, it might occur to you this morning, you go, well, wait a minute. 
Didn't Jesus say something about all of us are supposed to be servants? We should be serving each other? Yes, he did. As a matter of fact, Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 and 27, Jesus says, he's talking, hang on, let me give you context before I read it, about how rulers, political authorities, people with power, they have this tendency to, to hold their power over the heads of others. And Jesus says, that's not the way it should be with my followers. He says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Yeah, all believers, everybody who considers themselves a follower of Christ, we are supposed to be servants. As a matter of fact, in Jesus' words here, he says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your diakonos, your deacon, your servant. So we are blessed when we choose to follow God in a special way and say, I'm going to serve. And you don't have to have a special office to do that. All of us can say, I'm going to be a servant to other people because I want to be great in God's kingdom. So another question is, what's so special about the deacon ministry? Um, In the book of Acts, we find that is really where the whole deacon ministry came from. And so that is the Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 that I was referring to before. Um, Very early on, and when I say early on, I mean Jesus died on a cross. He was with all these believers, and he ascended into heaven. The church is just brand new. It's just barely getting rolling, and they had problems. One of the problems that they had was, let me back up a step. Um, If you were a believer of Jesus's right at the beginning, then you'd be Jewish. There were no Christians. There was no such thing as, you know, the Christian church. There were definitely no Baptist churches. Um, so you, would, you were either a Hellenistic Jew, which means you're part of the family. You are from the line of Abraham, and you may or may not practice Judaism, but you're in the family. And then there were Grecian Jews, and that is people who lived there in the area where Jesus lived. They were Greeks, and they were people who said, I think there's something to this. I'm going to become Jewish in order to understand better Jesus and his teachings and everything that's going on. Or maybe they just became Jewish because they saw value in the Jewish religion. So you had Hellenistic Jewish people, and you had Grecian Jewish people. And then, if you were a single woman in biblical days, life would be really tough for you. It was a male-dominated society. You couldn't just go out and get a job somewhere. It wasn't like, oh, it's easy. I'll provide for my family. i got to be very careful. I'm not saying it's easy if you're a single parent right now. Uh, I grew up in a single-parent household. I know it's not a piece of cake. But I'm saying, comparatively speaking, it's a lot easier now than it was then. And so the church decided, we're going to help. We'll provide food for these widows, these single women, every day. Make sure that they're taken care of. But a major problem cropped up. A major problem cropped up. There was a racial issue that came up in the church. The Hellenistic Jews, the people who were in the family, they were getting fed. But the, the moms who were Greek, who were single, were not getting any food. And so they complained, hey, what about these ladies? They're not getting what they need. And the church said, we can't have that. we got to do something about this. And so we find the solution that they came up with is here in Acts. Acts chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, it says, In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows We're being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. I know. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. And we'll turn this responsibility over to them. And we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. 
So the early church leaders were like, we should be praying. We should be studying the scripture. We need to be telling people about Jesus. Messiah has come. We shouldn't be taking care of tables and making sure that people get food. We need some good, godly people that we can give this job to, and we know that they'll take care of it, and it'll be done well. Um, so the, over time, the official office of deacon became a thing. You know, early on it was just, we need some godly people to handle this. But eventually they said, we're going to make this official. We like that we have these leaders. And so what we find in our First Timothy passage is an older pastor, a guy named Paul, is telling a younger pastor, a guy named Timothy, these are the kind of people that you're looking for to be in that office. And so let's take a look at our passage for today. This is First Timothy chapter 3 beginning in verse 8. Deacons, likewise, are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. So, deacons are supposed to be people who are honest, they're upright, they're trustworthy. Um, They ought to be people whose lives measure up with God's Word. And I think it's appropriate for all of us who are gathered here today to say, God, am I that kind of person? Like, I come to you, Lord, on your terms. Am I the kind of person who's going to live the way that you want me to live, according to your Scripture, according to your Word? Or am I just doing life the best I know how without ever consulting God? That's an important question for all of us. But, but Paul's saying here, especially for that person that you're going to put in an office, whether it's an elder or a deacon or whoever they are, and there's a reference here, they should be tested. What kind of test? Jason, we're going to have some algebra and geometry a little later in the service, so I hope you're prepared for that. <laughs> all right. He's honest. Don't you like it? All right. One author has said elders and deacons alike must pass the test of background, reputation, experience, and confession. Perfection is not the standard. If it were, no man or woman would be qualified to serve in Christ's church. Instead, the potential elder or deacon must lead a repentant life a life free of grievous ongoing sin. They should be people who have no tendency toward misbehavior that they are not trying to correct. I want to be really careful that we don't take our deacons and put them on some pedestal and be like, well, they're perfect spiritual beings who don't sin like the rest of us. Anytime somebody's in a place of leadership, we're all sinners, every single one of us. And we've all failed in the past, and I got news for you, I'm going to fail you in the future. All leaders will, eventually. But what we want, what we are looking for is people who are surrendered to Christ, who are doing their best to yield every facet of their life over to Him. There is not perfection yet, except what the Holy Spirit works in us. So let's don't hold them to a wrong standard but we are holding deacons to a high standard. Um, So let's continue reading here. This is verse 11. In the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be the husband of but one wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in the faith in Christ Jesus. So it is significant that both the deacon and his wife be people of character, be people who do a good job in their home, who love the Lord and serve Him. Um, and while I think, you know, based on the Scripture, those things seem very obvious, there, are, there is an issue that I think this brings up, and I think it is important for me to address it. Uh, that issue is, can women serve as deacons? Some people say no, because the qualifications here are written toward men, They say he must be the husband of but one wife. Um, And then, uh, 
I, I want you to know I don't think it's quite that cut and dried. I don't think it's quite that simple, and I'll, let me explain why. In Romans chapter 16, verse 1, we read, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in Centria. And in that passage of Scripture, the word servant is the female word deacon. And so the question is, is she a servant? Is she just somebody that serves a lot and she's characterized by her servitude-ishness? Or does she have an official office as a deaconess in the church? Well, we don't know. It doesn't tell us in the passage of Scripture. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11, which we read, it literally says, In the same way, the women of them are to be worthy of respect not malicious talkers. Well, does that mean the wife of the deacon or does that mean the female version of a deacon, the deaconess? Again, the passage of Scripture doesn't tell us which one we're talking about. So, I try to teach you what the Bible says and I think I've just done that. Now I'm going to give you my opinion for whatever that's worth. Uh, In my opinion, both things are being implied here. That we're talking about Husbands and wives serving together, that the female counterpart to the deacon is the deacon's wife, who is a deaconess, and there probably was some kind of official capacity in that sense in the Bible. Uh, The reason I say that is because think about why they're there. What's going on? What's the problem that they're dealing with? They got all of these single women who need ministry. Now, brothers and sisters, would we take our... Husbands, fathers, brothers, friends, and put them in a situation where you're a married man, but we want you ministering to all of these single women day after day after day. You go, well, I don't know, maybe. How about this? In Hebraic society, if you were Jewish and you came from the Jewish family, they were known for being very conservative, right? You keep yourself clothed and covered all the time. It's kind of a Middle Eastern culture. And Greeks, anybody in here ever seen a Greek statue before? Are they known for incredible clothing? No. If anything, the Greek culture was known for being very immodest. And that, these are the people that they're having a problem with. And so these Jewish people are saying, let's take our husbands, men, father, all these guys, and let's send them out there to minister to these single immodest people i don't think it would have been wise to just send these men in there without saying why don't we make this a ministry of yours and your wife together to take care of these people that makes perfect sense to me now i need to mention here at corinth baptist church we don't ordain women as deacons generally speaking i understand that the church has before in the past Um, but first let me say I'd be remiss if I didn't say there is at least one woman here at the church who is ordained as a deacon and she does a fantastic job she is loving and kind and gracious and humble and doesn't ask to be on the active board she serves the Lord along with her husband they're fantastic people uh But, so the reason that we don't is because we have this active board of men right now who are serving the Lord, who are involved in ministry, who do a good job. Uh, And I think there's two things. One, there is this propensity in churches when when a bunch of guys know that the ladies are going to handle it, they go, good, whew, I'm done. I don't have to do another thing. They'll take care of it. Well, we got men who are doing well, and I appreciate that. I don't want them to pull the plug on their ministry. And two, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And I don't want to cause a big disturbance, and I think that would happen here at the church if we pushed for female deacons in a church that traditionally has had almost all male deacons along the way. So I just want you to understand why we are sort of moving the way that we are moving here. Um, Another question that we should maybe discuss very quickly is, why do we ordain deacons? Ordination is saying, we see that God is at work in your life. And we pray that God blesses that. 
And so, Jason, I want you to know we see God at work in your life. We believe that he is doing something in you and that you are ministering to other people. And, um, and Jill, we believe that your role in this is very important. You know, whether you are ministering directly, which may be, Sometimes maybe Jason needs to go visit somebody and, and you go with him and you help and pray for and encourage there. Or maybe you minister and it's indirectly. You know, it is like, I'm going to stay home and take care of grandkids or take care of the house or do things to help here so that Jason can be free to go and do some other ministry some other time. Uh, either way, we recognize you are crucial in this whole picture. And so we want to pray for both of you. We see God at work in both of your lives and believe that you meet these biblical qualifications. So I am going to ask Jason and Jill, would you please stand? Uh, Let's put that this thing up on the board. I'm going to ask you to commit yourself to this ministry, Jason. Do you promise to strive to live your life to the best of your ability in a way that honors Christ? Do you promise in the presence of God in this congregation to accept the title of deacon, avoiding sin, and performing all the duties of this office to the best of your knowledge and ability? All right. Thank you, brother. Jason, Jill, would you guys come and stand here or sit in these chairs right here in front? Um, deacons, I think it is a good time for those of you who are on the active board to recommit yourselves as well to the ministry that you have. And so I'd like to ask you the same things. Deacons, do you promise to strive to live your life to the best of your ability in a way that honors Christ? Do you promise in the presence of God in this congregation to honor your title as deacon, avoiding sin and performing all the duties of this office to the best of your knowledge and ability? If you do, would you say, I do? Thank you, deacons. Congregation, do you acknowledge Jason Overton as having been called and gifted as a servant of Christ? Do you promise to encourage and to pray for him in his office and to cooperate with him in the fulfillment of his mission here in the church and also as part of God's kingdom? Congregation, if you would commit to that, would you say, I do? I do. Uh, I know that in a world of coronavirus, this might be a little bit daunting. Uh, Traditionally, what you do with people is you lay hands on them and pray for them. And so I have already asked Jason and Jill, are you guys okay with this? Are you all comfortable in this situation? And they both said, absolutely. We want God's people to put their hands on and pray for us. And so, so traditionally in Christian circles... The ordained people come and lay hands on and pray for those that we are ordaining. And so this morning, I'm going to invite the ordained to come and to do that. But our church also has the tradition, there is no harm in having other people lay hands on and pray as well. And so after we do the part with the ordained people, then I'll invite the congregation at large, if you would like to come through and lay hands on and pray for them, then you would also be invited to do that. So uh, those of you who are ordained, I'm inviting you, if you would come, maybe come around this way, and and if we could social distance out that way a little bit, that would be good, Um, and then and we'll just move ahead from there. So those of you who are ordained, would you come lay hands on and pray for the Overtons? Jason, Jill, I hope that you hear a great word of confidence from our church. We love y'all, and we are supporting you in this ministry. We pray that God blesses you. Um, I I appreciate y'all being good sports about all this, and so I'm going to let you off the hook. Y'all are welcome to go back and um, and have a seat. Um, I, I just want to say, I know that if you are not a Christian, that this may seem pretty unusual to you. But I want you to understand, if you're a guest with us today, there is a God who speaks. And he speaks clearly to our hearts and to our lives. And he is transforming we who put our trust in him. And I'm not inviting you to take some blind leap of faith to just to do something that seems weird or strange or, or that wouldn't make any sense to you. 
Um, but what I do want to invite you to do is understand who this God is and invite Him into your life. And even if, even if you're not at that point, God will make Himself known to you as one that you can trust. We've been studying through the book of Hebrews and we see that over and over again. He asks us to trust Him because He's trustworthy. And if you haven't met Him yet, I would love to introduce you. And so I'm going to invite you this morning. We're going to sing a song together. And during this song, if you'd like to talk to somebody about Christ, about how you can have a relationship with God, then I would love to hear from you what God's doing in your life and share a little bit with you. And so I'm going to stand over here by the piano. And, and you're being invited during this song. Come and let me know what God's doing. Come and, and, and tell me. I'd love to in, meet this God or understand how he is trustable. Um, Give me opportunity to introduce you to him. That's your invitation today.